uh, maybe refocus to be the last panel on the thematics, who pays, when can banks fail and not fail? Um, and uh, I propose we jump into uh, the topic. We have the first speaker is uh, Christoph Nijdam. Christoph Nijdam is an ex-banker, more than 30 years in banks and an ex-financier, and now he's a bank stock analyst at Alpha Value. And we, the second speaker is Duncan Lindo from Finance Watch, also an ex-banker. So we have two ex-bankers for the end. And uh, he's uh, responsible for the research on banks at Finance Watch. He's also a member of uh, RMF Research, Money and Finance, uh, a research group at the SOAS School for Oriental and African Study, University of London. So, Christoph, if you want to start. Thank you. Uh, I'll try to be kind of brief. Uh, this uh, portion, the fourth panel, is about resolution. Uh, I would have felt personally a little bit more comfortable with the prevention subject, but since I was invited for the resolution subject, I'm here. I'm a big believer in two things. Uh, the first thing is that it's better to prevent than cure. The second thing I strongly believe in is that in order to prevent and also to cure when you need to cure efficiently, one has to respect a basic rule, which is called as the KISS rule. KISS standing for keep it simple, stupid, with a question mark at the end. <coughs> now, resolution is a highly technical subject. And as I said before, it's not really my cup, of, my cup of tea. I'll try to stick to the essential. I will leave to my friend Duncan on the right with the technical details. But one can still apply the key rule to the resolution issue and stick to the essential. <coughs> the fundamental question is when a bank messes up, who pays? or who should pay for it. There is the short answer which is given to us from the highly efficient banking lobby, be it in German here or in France. Society should pay with an exclamation point. It's called the moral hazard, as you know it, with the following unacceptable asymmetry. Head, the bankers win through unjustifiable bonus and stock options. Tail the taxpayers pick up the cleanup bill directly through a bailout or indirectly through an exploding public debt and exploding unemployment rate. And then there is society's point of view. The one that creates the cost must be at the cost. It's very simple. That being said, who must bear the cost when it's time to pay? We must distinguish between the bank's creditors, between the one who funds the banks, in the case of a bail-in, as opposed to a bail-out. The slide that's above my head here was compiled by aggregating numbers for the 38 European listed banks in 13 countries that I and my colleagues at Alpha Value in Paris cover as bank stock analysts. Alpha Value in two words, it's an independent research firm. We're not a brokerage firm and we're fully independent because we have investors, mostly big institutional investors, who pays for research which is not tainted by any type of commission. So what do those numbers show? First of all, our coverage, 25 trillion in euros. That's the total balance sheet of the 38 banks. Basically, that's 54% of the European banking system, including the banks that are not listed. The European banking system, it's about 46,000 billion euros, according to Finance Watch. So what we can see on that slide here 
with the 100% being the total balance sheet, is that the equity portion of those big listed banks only represents 4.3%. The minority interest, which is also part of equity, it's 02 Preferred shares, which are another type of loss-absorbing type of equity, is 03 Sub-debt, subordinated debt, it's another 0.5. Altogether, this represents 6.3% of their assets. The EC Commission came with a report about the crisis when they say that altogether, the European government, when I, which I stated this morning, had to come up with 5,050 billion euros in state guarantees, even so only one third was used to make sure that the entire system does not collapse. In that report, the EC also said, in order to avoid the government bailouts, which I just mentioned, the state guarantees, those banks would have needed, compared to their current equity, another 10% of total assets. Now, as you know, as part of the Likanen report, which is being buried thanks to the German and French banking bills. Lekanen report said, hey, look guys, and you see that with those numbers, if you just stop at the sub-debt, the six point something percent, it won't be sufficient for not having again the taxpayers being called in for the next crisis. So it is essential and I speak as a former banker. A banker knows the type of risk he takes. He's a professional credit risk person. Haircuts will be necessary to be taken by bonds and securities here, which excludes repos. Repos, it's secured lending with collateral that should not be haircut but also the interbank market. The interbank market, which is right now frozen because there is no longer any interbank market, it's the ECB, which is the last interbank market of resort, of last resort. So it is essential when you ask the question, who is going to pay? That senior debt pays. Now, I want to digress a little bit versus my subject, and even so it's a resolution subject, I'm not going to tell you exactly what should be done in case of resolution. Maybe you have some question about that. But I'll tell you what exactly we should not have been done since the beginning of the crisis. Because there have been three taboos which has been breached since the beginning of the crisis, committed by either US authorities or by European authorities. The first taboo which was broken it's September 2008, when the US government decided to show the example to let Lehman Brothers go bankrupt. And it was a systemic institution. That was the first mistake. In terms of resolution, don't do that again. The second breach of confidence, if I may say so, was in July 2011, when the European forced the so-called PSI, private sector involvement, i.e. haircut, debt forgiveness, on the public Greek debt. What was breached there in terms of principle is Greece was part of Europe, and I'm not going to defend the Greeks, but it was part of the Eurozone, it was public debt, Public debt as part of the Eurozone was supposed to be a risk-free type of investment, and there is in finance, which I also teach at Paris uh, University at Sciences Po, you have to make sure that you have a risk-free type of investment so that you can build up over that the entire financial reasoning and industry. That was a huge mistake. I remember, for instance, a French Ministry of Finance who is now heading the IMF, saying to the French bankers, and I'm not going to defend the French bankers, I'm highly critical of them, 
look, watch my lips, trust me, there won't be any debt forgiveness regarding Greek bonds. So what did the French bankers do? They kept those goddamn bonds on their balance sheet. And in July 2011, they had to write off, I make a long story short, 75% of that amount. That second breach, as, as a consequence, the uh, Eurozone liquidity crisis of uh, H2 2011. And now, today, March 2013, we are still in the woods, we are not out of the woods, and we have the Cyprus thing. That's the third bridge of confidence. Cyprus is a teeny tiny island with a population of 870,000 people. It is as small as my native city in the southern France called Marseille, which has a, not a very nice reputation. But the problem with Cyprus, it's not the size of the island. It's not the size of its GDP, 17 billion euros. It's not the size of its banking problem, about 10 billion euros. It's the fact that some politicians messed up big time over a weekend to decide, and that the third breach of confidence, that we should take, or they should take a haircut on deposits. I'm not going to defend the Cypriots. I'm not going to defend the drug dealers with Russian origins who have put their money in Cyprus. The point is there is that you have created a precedent. The point is, if you look at that on the left side, deposits is about one third of the funding of European banks. It's the biggest brick. If you shatter the confidence on that biggest brick, you're going to have a third systemic crisis. Whom can we trust? That brick, the 34% of deposits, relies on only two principles. The first one is it is safe because there is some kind of limited state deposit guarantee up to 100 kilo euros, which was not even respected in the first proposal for Cyprus because it was said that, oh, look, yes, there is a state guarantee up to 100 kilos euros. But anyway, it's a tax. That tax is a haircut, and that represents 6.75% of your money. The second principle on the Cyprus thing is that we must trust that the money we put in the bank as citizens is safe that my salary, your salary, which is credited to your bank account at the end of the month, we need it to pay for providing a roof and food to our family and to our children. And we have to be convinced that it could not be spoliated, confiscated over a weekend because that's the only way to get out or because you have a young trader in a Paris trading room that has blown out the bank. So it has been a big, big mistake from my point of view to have touched that third principle with the Cyprus thing. As a closing point, and maybe I'm referring to what I've heard uh, all day long, personally, I can't see how we can have a common deposit insurance scheme within the European Banking Union if we don't split the investment banking capital markets activities from the corporate and retail bank, which we call more commonly commercial banking. Why? I don't see the German taxpayer being willing to pay for Mr. Kerviel's problems at Société Générale. And frankly, as a French taxpayer, I don't want to have to pay for Deutsche Bank's problems in its derivative books, which I mentioned earlier. Thank you.
name is uh, Duncan Lindo from Finance Watch, as you've heard. Um, I want to just start quickly with our, where R&R fits in. Uh, and as the last speaker on the last panel, I'm sorry that R&R is not rest and recuperation, but is recovery and resolution. Um, I think that it, it become, it's part of regaining uh, sovereignty of the public interest over banks, or part of breaking the doom loop. Uh, and it is part of a, um, a solution where we spend less on bailing out banks. So this, this, this has sort of three key elements. First of all is we need to lower the likelihood of bank failure. And to some extent, that's what the uh, capital requirements are trying to do. Uh, and we might debate how successfully CRD4 manages to do that. Um, we also need to reduce the, the, the incidence of intervention or the occasions that the government is forced to intervene. Uh, and there I think that we need a separation of, of activities which cannot be interrupted, which basically means bank credit money, payments and deposits. And, and also an ending too big to fail uh, are the key, key steps to take. Uh, and then finally, in the instances where government does need to intervene, which it will need to sometimes, let's face it, uh, then lowering the cost of that intervention. And that's really where the bail-in tool, which is probably the most con um, controversial of the, the resolution tools, comes in. So I I've only got a, a few slides. I just want to talk quickly about prevention and recovery, because I also agree that uh, recovery and resolution, the most important job it can do is, is prevention. Then I will talk about resolution and, and try and highlight some things about the bail-in by comparing it to the depositor tax that was recently proposed in Cyprus, as most of us sort of read about. And finally, I'll come to, to the single resolution mechanism. Again, I'll try and be brief. So I think that the, the recovery and resolution uh, law that is currently somewhat stuck between the Council and the Parliament at European level, um, the most important job that it should try and do is, is prevention. No matter how good your resolution tools are, uh, the less work they have to do, the more effective they'll be. Uh, and secondly, crises are, are always surprising. So it's impossible to foresee all the elements of the next crisis. That's why we always talk about legislating for the last crisis and not the next one. And therefore, the recovery and resolution planning should be something that has real teeth, such that uh, authorities should be able to go in uh, and reshape banks to ensure that, that they can fail, basically. The, the aim should be that as many institutions as possible should be able to fail on their own without causing a systemic risk. Uh, and that if they have activities that really must be rescued, that, that things are simple enough that, that they can be resolved. Which brings us very quickly to recovery, uh, and I don't have much to say on recovery, but uh, the, the argument that we often hear about early intervention from the bank side is that we can't touch property rights, uh, which is uh, baloney to use, uh, I believe, an American expression. And, and the analogy I like to use is, is nuclear power stations, where uh, if somebody said, you can't come in and intervene in a nuclear power station before a meltdown uh, because you'll interfere with the property rights of the shareholders, you would laugh them out of the room. And banks, uh, it's, a, it's a similar situation. We, there's such damage when banks do fail that we, we society has the right to, to insist that they're safe while, while they are operating because by the time they fail, it's too late to do anything. So moving to resolution, uh, as I said, the aim should be that as many bank institutions can fail through normal insolvency rules as possible. But as we've heard, as our, as our salary gets paid into bank accounts and we use it to pay for our mortgage and our uh, electricity and water and everything else, uh, bank credit money functions cannot be interrupted for a day. Their, their very existence re requires uh, con continuity. Every single day we must be able to get money out of the ATM. Uh, and therefore, a, s a normal insolvency would not work for these functions because normal insolvency, by definition, ceases payments and tries to sort things out. Therefore, resolution needs a special um, insolvency regime. 
uh, one which allows these essential uh, services to continue, but at the same time then can address solvency problems in an insolvent bank. And above all, apply the creditor hierarchy, long established, equity first, then junior debt, then senior debt. Um, and I can say something about separation quickly here. It, it, my line for separation is very, very clear. The things that cannot be interrupted should be separate from the things that can be interrupted. Uh, bank credit money cannot be interrupted even for a day, as SNS Real showed us. There was enough money in the deposit guarantee scheme, but because the payment system would have been interrupted and people wouldn't have been able to make payments, the government was forced to nationalise it. Um, market maker, if a market maker goes bust, provided we've dealt with too big to fail, which is, I, I agree, a big proviso, one of ten market makers can go bust, and the market will continue to be made by the other market makers. Lehman dropped out of the market for CDS, but CDS continues to be made. Uh, bond underwriting is already done in syndicates, so if one of a syndicate of three drops out, the other two can carry on, or somebody else can step in. So for me, trading functions uh, can be interrupted by the failure of one institution, and bank credit money provision cannot. Uh, so moving on then to exemptions, because several exemptions were proposed to bail-in, which is really what was... Bail-in is really a, uh, a bad term in my, my regard, because it, it, it conjures up images of a new set of... a new class of debt which could be bailed in while the others are not. And that, for me, that's really not the point of the resolution regime. The resolution regime should be a way to, as I say, don't interrupt essential services, but apply the credit hierarchy properly. Uh, several exemptions were, uh, were proposed to this. Probably the most dangerous was derivatives. Um, and I think the main point about it is this. If you exempt a class of liabilities from, from losses, the natural incentive for the bank is to, <laughs> to, pour all of the, to, to pour all of their balance sheet into these liabilities. So if you exempt uh, derivatives, then especially derivatives as they are so flexible, uh, more and more of the liability side of the balance sheet will be, will be funded with, with, in this case, derivatives. And when you come to try and apply bail-in, there will not be any liabilities left to bail-in because the, the incentive you've created is to, is, is to increase the exempted liabilities. Um, the last point I wanted to make on, on, on this is that the, the proposed law at the European level doesn't really talk about the need for liquidity in, in, in resolve. Uh, banks that are in resolution. Uh, and it's critical that a bank that comes into resolution will be in crisis and will already be in receipt of central bank uh, emergency liquidity. Uh, a bank in resolution, if you are to continue, must be liquid. Uh, and central bank liquidity tends to encumber assets uh, so they can't be sold to raise money. And it, in, and it also encumbers liabilities because the central bank's liabilities become senior to everybody else. So the effectiveness of the regime that was proposed by the European Commission is perhaps uh, lessened by the fact that, the, that they don't adequately consider the amount of emergency li uh, li liquidity that will be needed. So I just wanted to quickly comment on the depositor tax proposal that, that was... A, uh, is now abandoned, I think, thanks to the Cypriot government, but was, was floated um, this week. Uh, and the first thing to say that it, there was no insolvency, so the, the depositor tax is, is, is almost the opposite of, of bail-in because there was no insolvency involved. And the fact that there was no insolvency allowed them not to respect the creditor hierarchy uh, and, in fact, start at the end with the depositors, which, as we heard, should be the last people that have to pay. Um, in uh, a bailout, as, we, as, as I explained before, when you, when you move through the creditor hierarchy, you, you eliminate, um, first of all, equity and then junior debt. Uh, and what's happening here is, in fact, the opposite, because deposits were swapped for equity. So, in fact, this was, a, um, in a way, a, an equity injection by the government. Uh, that equity was given straight to deposit holders uh, and, of course, will be completely worthless to them. But nevertheless, in, a, in balance sheet terms, it was, a, was, a, was an injection of equity. And again, liquidity is the key, because as we've seen, I think today, this afternoon, breaking is the ECB is threatening to withdraw the emergency liquidity funding if they don't come up with a deal. 
And this is the absolute key, is the power of the ECB to pull down the, the, the Cypriot banking um, sector. Uh, and that brings us, it's the usual story of the crisis. And notwithstanding that, that there was a haircut on Greek bonds, by the time that had happened, uh, the ECB had provided enough liquidity that the banks of the core nations of Europe were off the hook for, for the large part of their losses. The, there is little European mutualization. The ESM still lacks the ability to, to, to bail out banks. Uh, and that left the local citizens to pay through various mechanisms. Usually that's been austerity, but uh, in this instance it was a more naked grab at their deposits. Um, I, I think William, I haven't read all of his piece, but William Buter in uh, Citibank said uh, this is a step in the right direction, the Cyprus situation, because essentially the sovereign has been saved. There's not, not going to be a, a default of the, the Cypriot so sovereign in the next few months. Uh, and we've started some sort of private bail-in process. And I would argue that this is again not the case, and this is again the opposite of a bail-in, uh, because all that's happened is that the holders of Greek Cypriot, um, Greek Cypriot, Cypriot sovereign debt uh, are off the hook. There's a, there's a large redemption due in June, mainly held by hedge funds, and guess what? They're going to get their money back. Uh, and as we said before, local citizens are, were, were being asked to pay the price. Uh, and that, that sort of brings us to this idea that sovereigns here are being treated like uh, any other borrower rather than something special. Uh, which kind of brings me to the, the last point, which is the banking union. I, 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 we think there's a, there's a very grave danger with pushing on with single resolution mechanism at this point. Um, when we talk about the sovereign bank doom loop, one thing I often hear is that we need to de-link banks from sovereign. And I, I've, I've given you an, an English word there, poppycock, which means complete nonsense. Uh, how you can de-link a bank from a sovereign. Where's it, where's it going to go? It's going to sort of float off into space. Right? No, it cannot. Banks emerge from the economy as specialists, uh, as allocators of credit, and they are intimately tied up with the rest of the economy. The rest of the economy is dependent on banks. Banks are dependent on the rest of the economy. Sovereigns emerge from this uh, and try and represent the economy as a whole. The idea of, of de-linking these things is... is is nonsensical, but that's what we're supposed to believe. And, and it also points to the power that banks have, have come to have in society. Sovereigns were supposed to imperil themselves to rescue banks, but banks now are able to walk away from the mess of sovereign default. We, we really don't want to bring the banking system down if sovereigns default. Um, sovereigns are not just another borrower that banks happen to have got over-indebted to. They're, they're not just someone that happens to provide our hospitals and things. They're, they're representatives of society, and we shouldn't, we shouldn't allow the banks to be sovereign, uh, sovereign over sovereigns. Uh, banks and sovereigns are the two sides of the same coin. So if we, if we look at what, what, what are we proposing with a single resolution mechanism, when we look at the bank side and the supranational sovereign side, um, on the bank side, this idea that we move everything to supranational kind of implies that we think the banks have become so big just because they're operating in the single market geographically, and therefore um, all we need to do is geographically match their bigness with a bigger geographical uh, supervisor. But that's not what's made them so powerful. What's made them so powerful is their change of activities. They've, they've taken on derivatives trading, uh, they've increased their lending to individuals, we have student loans and all the rest of it, they've mingled the two with securitizations and so on and so forth. Uh, and the point is, if we don't take any measures to control those activities, we don't control their power. It's not simply by moving to a geographically bigger area that we constrain them. We, we must take action to control their powers. And that should be through things like capital requirements, through separation, <coughs> through too-big-to-fail measures, caps on size and all the rest of it, and on um, resolution mechanisms. Uh, and so far, I think the jury's out on whether we're really achieving that. I mean, CRD4, the, the leverage caps that were at one point part of the proposal are now out the window. Um, the bank resolution uh, proposal is, is, is stuck in council. 
Uh, and as we've heard earlier, it's not clear whether the Commission and the European Parliament will go for a strong structural separation. So the, the jury's really out on whether the current round of reforms to banks are going to constrain their activity. And then on the supranational side, to resolve, a, as we said earlier, uh, crises are unexpected. You need to move fast. You need to raise money very quickly and bail out, bail out the banks that you need to bail out. For all the criticisms we can have of, of what nation states did in the crisis, they raised money quickly, they indebted themselves, and they bailed out their banks. At the moment, Europe can't do that because there's no political will to, to mutualize the losses through fiscal means, through common bond issuance, and so on and so forth. And where I see the danger is that we do nothing to address the growth of banks. We move on with um, a single resolution mechanism that in the end has no teeth. And in fact, what we do is we, move, we just make the whole thing prob bigger. We, we think that we've moved it to the supranational level and made it safer. But in fact, I think what the grave danger is that we make it more dangerous. And I think, as we, as we said earlier, I think uh, we should put a break on the single resolution mechanism and concentrate on building a, a deeper European Union before we take that step. And I, I'm out of time, so I won't say it all again. Because I've heard it the first time. We have 15 minutes for questions. If you could keep the question to the point and very concise, so we can gather a maximum of questions. Peter Val. Thank you. Herr Nischdam, Sie haben davon gesprochen, dass Sie als französischer Steuerzahler nicht für eine Bankrottfirma Deutsche Bank zahlen wollen und umgekehrt das auch nicht erwarten. Das ist die Perversion der Solidarität, von der Lukas Theise heute Morgen gesprochen hat. Okay, da folge ich. Aber was halten Sie von der Idee, einen Fonds zu schaffen, der von der Finanzindustrie selbst gefüllt wird, um sozusagen im Fall einer Krise ein Bailout aus einem solchen gemeinsamen Fonds zu bezahlen? Another question? We can take three. Camilo? Thanks, Camilo von Villa, uh, University of St. Gallen. Uh, Mr. Nishtal, a question to you first and then a question to Duncan. Um, you, you mentioned those, uh, or you mentioned three capital failures, and two of them applied directly to the European. Union or the Europe, uh, ECB and its handling of, of the crisis. And my question is, do you think that these are one-time unfortunate slips or are they expressions of some deeper problem? And if this be the case, um, what do you think this problem is and what could be done to, to overcome it? Uh, and the second question goes to Duncan. And I, I'd just be grateful for some elaboration on, I think, on your Second to last slide, uh, you, you mentioned uh, the idea of uh, that it's public talk to talk about separation of uh, states and banks, and I don't really see the risk that we see, that we have a, a stronger separation at the moment. I rather see see more uh, yeah move it, see the, those sectors moving ever closer together right now and. Maybe I just misunderstood you, and so I would be very, very grateful for some elaborations on that. Thank you very much. And the gentleman at the end. Um, yeah, Philip Herse. I teile these Befürchtungen, that we sozusagen gerade bei den SIFIs mit einem äh, vorher absehbaren ähm, äh, ja, Reservierungsscheme äh, eigentlich nicht wirklich weit kommen, dann wäre das für mich aber ein Grund nochmal das Argument von Lukas Zeise aufzunehmen, der gerade ja fragte, warum machen wir es dann eigentlich nur noch mit öffentlichen Banken? Jetzt kann man da für den kleinen und mittleren Teil sich fragen, vielleicht geht das da auch anders, wobei wir mit den Genossenschaftsbanken sehr gute Erfahrungen machen, ohne dass sie deswegen notwendigerweise staatliche sind. Aber wenn es zumindest nicht zu erwarten ist, dass wir SIFIs tatsächlich so abwickeln können, dass sie nicht dem Steuerzahler auf die Füße fallen und die aber aufgrund ihrer Größe entweder gewünscht sind oder aus äh, diesen Gründen zumindest externe positive Effekte 
bringen und dann dementsprechend auch Gewinne generieren, dann wäre es doch wenigstens sinnvoll, dass diese Gewinne sozusagen in den guten Zeiten dann auch in die Staatskasse fließen als öffentliche Eigentümer um eben genau damit sozusagen dann auch das abzubezahlen, was man in der Krise davor für deren Rettung möglicherweise ausgegeben hat. Uh, bailout funds funded by the banks. Uh, as far as I understand, uh, there is a project in that respect. Um, I, I'm more at ease with discussing the French situation than the entire European banking industry because I can be uh, everywhere at the same time and there is so much to read. Uh, in the case of the French project, uh, there is on one side a deposit guarantee fund and then there is a resolution fund. Uh, the French project uh, is, has decided to merge those two funds and while right now in the deposit guarantee funds there is approximately about a billion five euros, um, in a few years the French project is to have with those two funds resolution and bank guarantee about 10 billion euros. Now if you really think that that's going to be sufficient to cover the, 100, uh, the 1600 billion dollars uh, dollars, uh, euros in French deposits, uh, I don't believe it in it. So uh, yes, we have to make uh, the bank pays for their mistakes, uh, but a resolution fund or a bank guarantee fund won't make it in terms of amount. So that's why I personally back the Lincoln and report recommendation, which is you have to, uh, and, and that's ca capitalism. Uh, you have to uh, wiped out the shareholders, wiped out the sub-debt, and wiped out the other professional unsecured lenders, be it the interbank market or, or, or the senior bonds. Uh, your question on the ECB, uh, this is being recorded. This is a slippery question, so I won't answer it. Uh, regarding sci-fis, uh, I'm not... Uh, uh, an expert about the uh, German banking system. Uh, but my understanding is that uh, one thing that you've got in Germany, which we don't have in France, is that you have about 1,500 local banks, which apparently very successfully finance the so-called Mittelstands, the uh, SME, the German SME that we French and other European parents uh, the other Europeans look forward. We would like to imitate. We would love to have the German Mittelstand. My point is that you only have one sci-fi in Germany, and it's Deutsche Bank. As part of the 28 global sci-fis in the world, there is only one German. It's Deutsche Bank. We, French, champion of the world, we have four. And as my friend Laurent Cielum said before, 95% of the French banking system would go under the ECB. Guess what? The French banks are happy about it. Why? Why? Just because with the banking union project, with a European bank guarantee scheme, they are the one who benefits the most because of the way our French banking system is structured. Was there another question? No, I think I, yeah. I wanted to add something very briefly, and that's uh, li listening to Duncan. Uh, I wanted to say regarding recovery and resolution plan. In France, BNP Paribas. BNP Paribas is still working on a resolution and recovery plan, which it has to present to the French supervisor, Autorité de Contrôle Prudentiel, and it's a document of 1,800 pages. The info comes from the BNP Paribas guys, who is an Anglo-Saxon, by the way, who is the one who wrote up that report. The one who believes that the French supervisor will be able to sort out this bowl of spaghetti, sorry for our Italian friend, over a weekend, 
over a weekend, if you think that the French regulators will be able to sort this packet ball, are living in Alice in Wonderland. The only way you can put in place, in practice, a resolution plan means that beforehand, up front, upstream, you have to put in various subsidiaries, ring fence subsidiaries, some of those activities. And that's the Lee Cannon Report recommendation. Yes. Right. Although the Cheshire Cat's just up there, I, <laughs> I completely agree with you. And that's exactly the point. If a resolution plan comes out that, that is complete fiction and is thousands of pages long, that, that's exactly the first thing the regulator should do is say, okay, this, this clearly is not going to work, and, and therefore you must separate your activities and make yourself not let's, 2,000 entities, but 20 entities. Let's make it simple, stupid. Public banks, um, not speaking as Finance Watch, because we haven't asked our members yet, but personally speaking, great, yeah, public banks, I'm all for them. Um, and if you were a supporter of public banks, I'm not speaking on behalf of Finance Watch, uh, you might think that separation would be a good first step, because uh, payment systems and bank credit money are most clearly utility-like. In fact, Andy Haldane at the, the Bank of England has already likened payment systems to utilities. So uh, I think we're not, we're, not, we're not at a point where, we can, where it's happening in the legislative process, public banks, but, but maybe separation is a first step. And just uh, Cresc, um, a research group from the University of Manchester, they, they had a report on the UK banking, and they talked about the um, RBS bit becoming public. Uh, and they point out that although RBS is 70-something percent owned by the state, what's really happened is the state has become more like a private equity fund. Uh, is, this is not nationalisation, this is privatisation of large part of the Treasury. Uh, what they're trying to do is restructure the thing to get as high a sale price as possible. Uh, and th that's still the, the course of action several years after they bought it. So I think, you know... Yes, public banks, for, personally for me, great, but we're a long way from that actually being a reality at the moment. Uh, we're more likely to see the, the sovereign become treated like just another corporation than, than, than the opposite. Uh, and I think Dominic's call for democratic banks would be another way to attack the problem. And we should look for democratic control of the ECB, we should look for democratic control in various places, and that might be another way to try and turn the tide, which quite frankly I think is going the way of of finance. Uh, and, yeah, I mean, I, I agree. It looks to me really like um, sovereigns and banks are becoming ever closer, but it's, it's one of the arguments that is given for banking union is that in order to kill the doom loop, we must delink banks from sovereigns, you know, as if, as if we must rescue the banks but let the sovereigns fail. You know, if all the hospitals stop, we must let the banks walk away. Uh, I think what's really being proposed is de-link them from the sovereign and re-link them to the supranational. And I think that, that re-linking to the supranational is what's dangerous because, quite frankly, I don't think we're, we're there yet. We haven't controlled their activities and we haven't, we haven't got a supranational that, that, that has a state behind it. The, the idea of Europe does not have a state behind it. Though, as we have. Are there any other questions? One, two... And uh, I think this is the last round, so last chance. Two questions. Uh, may I speak in English? Maybe it's easier. Okay, so I think on this question of um, bailout, Mr. Stolov showed this um, graphic on the capital cycle in the US, but if you look carefully again, you can see that it really went up after Glass-Steagall was abolished in 1999, and then the whole deregulation started overall also in Europe and that I think has to be really seen uh, and to t be taken into account. But uh, the point is that this whole inflationary pumping in of money since that time has certainly gotten a new uh, quali quality, if you want to speak about quality, with the policies of the ECB in the last period. And I think that really has to be taken very, very seriously, this hyperinflationary problem because nothing goes into the real economy, yeah, uh, and instead we have this real big, big uh, inflationary bubble uh, building up, which 
which is exploding. So that's one thing I, I would like you to um, comment on. And then I think in this situation, which I mentioned before, on the big danger of panic and just complete, you know, chaotic resolution or, or dissolution of this financial system around the um, Cyprus question, which is which is then only a, you know, you 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 uh, prick the bubble sort of, you know, then everything explodes. So this, I think, this really has to be confronted from a standpoint of social responsibility, because we had already vicious austerity, we have. De financial dictatorship, and people are out in the streets revolting, and it's a matter of life and death. And this we have to sort of confront, I think, as, as you know, people who are thinking uh, from an intellectual standpoint what to do about it. So from that standpoint, I would also like to ask you, referring to Mr. Zeise, um, on this matter of credit generation, because I completely agree that it shouldn't be left to the private banks. There should be a state credit generation in terms of projects, uh, I mean, getting the tax revenue up again by real economy, financing this, and I think that has to be put on the agenda now, because that is a matter of survival. It's a real economy, it's not all these bubbles, what people's lives depend on, so please comment. The gentleman, the last question. Um, ich würde gerne noch ein Beispiel nennen, in welcher Richtung wir vielleicht auch eine Lösung erwarten könnten. Das eine ist tatsächlich, wenn wir die ganz großen Banken nicht viel kleiner kriegen, indem wir sie zerlegen, dann gibt es ja auch die andere Strategie, dass sozusagen von unten kleinere Banken nachwachsen. Die Diskussion in Großbritannien, wie ich sie im Moment mitbekomme, ist der Gestalt, dass die sich gefragt haben, warum ist eigentlich Deutschland so viel besser durch die Finanzkrise gekommen und zwar von der realen Ökonomie, nicht nur jetzt von deren Finanzsektor und das Ergebnis war, ja in Deutschland gibt es einen Bankensektor, der auch eben kleine und mittelständische Unternehmen finanziert, unabhängig davon, ob in äh, New York und äh, London gerade die Börse verrückt spielt. Und darüber erst kam man in die Diskussion, wir brauchen in Großbritannien eigentlich auch sowas wie Sparkassensystem, nicht etwa als Alternative zu deren Großbanken, sondern als Alternative zur Finanzierung einer überhaupt noch produzierenden äh, Wirtschaft, äh, eines produzierenden Gewerbes, weil das sozusagen mit der Finanzkrise proportional auch ausgestorben ist, weil äh, sozusagen der kommerzielle Kredit an äh, Unternehmen überproportional gelitten hat dort in der Finanzkrise. So, und ähm, das wäre vielleicht was, gerade wenn wir über die europäische Diskussion reden, da sind wir eigentlich in Deutschland noch relativ gut dran mit den Sparkassen und dem Genossenschaftssektor, den wir haben. Ähm, nun sieht aber der Sparkassensektor in äh, Spanien logischerweise ganz anders aus. Das heißt, man kann sich nicht alleine auf den Begriff stürzen. Man müsste aber dieses Geschäftsmodell in irgendeiner Weise jenseits von Deutschland mal nachvollziehbar und populär machen, was offensichtlich funktionieren kann, wie das Beispiel in Großbritannien zeigt, was, wie mir die Sparkassen sagen, sozusagen auch auf deren eigene Arbeit zurückzuführen ist. Also die Sparkassen sind nach Großbritannien gefahren und haben versucht, den dortigen Abgeordneten zu erklären, wo ihr Problem liegt. Und das hat teilweise funktioniert. Warum sollte man das nicht auch mit anderen europäischen Ländern versuchen? Weil dann wäre auch die Chance, dass wir in den ganzen Regulierungen Basel III, ähm, der Bankenunion etc. nicht immer nur Regulierungen bekommen, die immer vom Standardtyp Großbank ausgehen. Das ist das, worunter hier die Genossenschaftsbanken und die Sparkassen leiden, dass sie sozusagen nicht der Normaltypus einer Bank sind und sich dafür immer entschuldigen müssen. Und da müssten wir aber eigentlich wieder hin. Danke. Uh, so we have three questions. One on the inflationary pressures, one on credit creation and one on the model of Sparkassen in the real economy. Do you all for him? Um, so to your point, so we, I mean, I, I wouldn't disagree with the urgency of the situation, um, and I, yeah, I think that there is massive growing, just to state the obvious to say, there's massive growing political pressure in, in Greece and, and elsewhere around the periphery. Uh, I, do th I do think that... Um, separation will go a long way to changing the balance of um, this credit creation away from financial instruments which are market-based to 
to old-fashioned banking. I, I really believe that many of the, the instruments that got traded um, during the boom years, in during 2000, were only marginal, marginally profitable uh, thanks to the funding rate. Uh, and if that funding rate had been 20 basis points or, or half, a, half a percent or something higher, those trades simply wouldn't have been economic and, and they wouldn't have happened. So I'm not, I'm not pretending that um, separation is a silver bullet that will cure everything by all means. But I, but, I mean, I, I sat on a trading floor while this stuff was being built and I, I really saw that if you move the cost of funding up, not very much, most of these trades didn't make any sense. Uh, and so I, I understand that that answer probably doesn't talk to the urgency that we feel about the situation politically, but um, you know, I'm here to talk about boring stuff like cost of funding. Right? So, uh, and so I, I mean, that's more or less what I've got to say about that. Look, Britain turning to Germany and saying, why does Germany do it so much better? We say that about everything. Penalties, beer, everything. SME funding. <laughs> <laughs> I get, the list is long, I tell you. Um, and yeah, I, I don't really know what to say. I mean, I mean, a, a diverse banking sector, which which has many small banks, uh, cooperative banks, public banks, democratic banks, uh, and in which the CIFIs are no more, is really, I think, what we should be aiming for. Uh, I mean, that that should be our first target. Get rid of the two bigs to fail, which most obviously means the CIFIs, but as Cyprus shows, also means other sorts of banks, the two connected and so on. Uh, and aim for something which is, which, yeah, has this diversity of cooperatives and sparkas and then cafes and building societies and so on. We are just on time. Thank you very much. Day, which uh, I think has been uh, really great. Uh, certainly to us at Finance Watch, uh, Having that sort of dialogue of different people, different organization, civil society getting together, thinking, debating is one of the keys to solving all those issues and to making finance of society. It has to start by proper debate and having society and civil society, A, getting together, B, being heard. So this is, you know, in my view, this was a great day. I'd like to summarize a few key points that certainly to me came out during the day and which I think are essential. And maybe we could take the example, it's just an illustration at the end of the day, of the Cyprus situation that tells us many things. Many things have been said today, but perhaps there is one or two things that can be added. The first thing that strikes me about the Cyprus situation is that it's been said today, small country, small banks, despite the fact that it's small countries, small banks, it becomes a huge problem for the entire Eurozone. So what we're witnessing in Cyprus is that we don't have only problem with too big to fail banks. We're talking about tiny banks by European standards. We don't have only a problem with CIFIs or whatever. We have built a system where any bank that has a problem somewhere in the zone becomes a problem for everybody. That is just not possible. I mean, we no system, no economic system can live with that. And that is something absolutely essential. Second thing we're seeing in, in Cyprus, which was discussed at length, but we have to, 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 to point it out, is the issue of who takes the losses when there are losses. It's no miracle. It's either the creditors, the taxpayers, or we just invented the depositors. Okay, fine. At the end of the day, the question is, do we want ordinary citizens to pay for the mistakes of professionals? In Ireland, it was ordinary citizens that had to pay because bailouts, so the Irish taxpayer and then the EU taxpayer had to pay. In Cyprus, it's the ordinary citizen because the businesses are being haircut. Oh no, I'm sorry, taxed. Uh, okay, so we have exactly the same situation. Ordinary citizens paying for the mistakes of professionals. And I'm not even going into all the money laundering and all the rest in Cyprus, but not, even not going into that, that's a key. So, and that is up to our politicians to decide. This is a political decision. We at Finance Watch in Brussels, we're seeing lobbying against, you know, proper bail-in directive. 
And, you know, bailing directive, as we understand and we all know in the jargon means, you know, who takes the losses? And we're seeing it. The French banking law at the moment refuses the bailing of senior creditors. Okay. We've seen the, 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 the slide from Christophe. That means that if you don't have the senior creditors taking the losses, who will take the losses? Taxpayers. Okay. Can we please say it? Can our politicians stand up and say, I want taxpayers to take the losses? And if it's not taxpayers, it has to be creditors. There is no miracle. So th this, and Cyprus is showing that again. And of course, the fact that the EU is not respecting its own law, okay, not abiding by its own rules because, you know, deposits under 100,000 euros are being, you know, attacked, is just not possible because banking is about trust, confidence. If you destroy trust and confidence, there's nothing left. Uh, so that is essential to understand. But it's not the only uh, implications we're seeing from, um, from, um, from the Cyprus situation. Banking union, a way of putting it is yes, but on the condition that there are many other things being done because banking union as such, as was rightly said by many speakers, including Laurence, Duncan, and, and a few others today, effectively reinforces moral hazard. Because what's banking union about? You have a bigger, stronger, supranational system to support banks. Correct, you know, they're, they're stronger. Oh yes, but doesn't the problem come from the fact that there's public support and therefore moral hazard and therefore funding subsidy and therefore distortion of activity and therefore finance not serving society? Yes, so we're building something where there will be more public support to banks. So why not? On the condition that we attacked banking structure issues, we have a proper resolution mechanism, i.e. creditors take losses and not taxpayers and not depositors. And there is a broader issue which, you know, we don't have time to debate, which, which is the, you know, the currency issue, you know, the Eurozone system. We don't have a complete currency and that has many implications. There is no risk-free rate, as Christophe pointed out in, uh, I think it was Christophe who said that. Um, uh, in, in, in the EU system, and that has very strong implications. Um, we have to stop moral hazard, otherwise we'll go nowhere. That's the source of all evils, and banking union alone reinforces moral hazard. Um, I started by saying that civil society getting together, debating, thinking, with nuances, and of course, you know, different people, different organizations may have nuances in the way they phrase things is essential. So let's continue doing that. Certainly we at Finance Watch really want to contribute to that debate. We'll organize similar meetings in other European cities. Uh, we want to do it again, of course, in Berlin, in Frankfurt, uh, but also we'll do it in, in, you know, Amsterdam, London, Paris, Rome. Uh, it is absolutely essential. So. You know, any initiative, any thinking you have about that, you know, let's, let's talk, let's get together, and let's continue the debate. Thank you. Die letzten beißen die Hunde. Ich will ganz kurz drei Argumente noch in die Debatte werfen. Normalerweise wird ja an dieser Stelle einer Veranstaltung schon ritualhaft erwartet, dass der, der dann spricht, wie der Zauberer sein Kaninchen aus dem Hut, jetzt den Aktionsplan aus der Tasche zaubert, mit dem er die Bankenunion entweder blockiert oder befördert oder eine Variante davon befördert. Ich werde das nicht tun und ich werde das aber nicht tun mit der Ausrede, dass die Dinge so komplex und kompliziert sind, sondern ich werde das als bewusste Entscheidung begründen. Und zwar mit folgendem Argument. Der Modus operandi von Zivilgesellschaft ist es, aus der Vielfalt der Probleme die Fähigkeit zu haben, bestimmte herauszugreifen, die zuspitzbar, die politisierbar, die unter Umständen auch skandalisierbar sind und die damit politische Mobilisierungsfähigkeit und politischen Druck entfalten können. Das geht nicht mit allen Themen. Also äh, Dinge wie einige, die wir heute besprochen haben, das spricht nicht gegen die Dinge und schon gar nicht gegen diese Beiträge, die da gekommen sind, sind aber für eine politisierbar, für die Umsetzung politischer Kampagnenfähigkeit von Zivilgesellschaft nicht geeignet. Äh, und hier kommt hinzu, dass äh, das Argument, das wir jetzt heute mehrfach gehört haben, 
die Zukunft dieser Bankenunion ohnehin ungewiss, ungewiss ist, dass sie unter Umständen an ihren eigenen Widersprüchen bzw. den Widersprüchen innerhalb der EU zerbrechen könnte, ist natürlich auch ein Argument, das damit hineinkommt. Aber, und das ist jetzt meine äh, zweite These oder mein zweites Argument, das heißt natürlich jetzt nicht die Hände in den Schoß zu legen und sagen, forget about the Bankenunion, äh, sondern man muss einen spezifischen Umgang jetzt mit, dieser, mit diesem Thema finden. Und ich denke, äh, das besteht darin, dass wir versuchen, in dem, was Thierry gesagt hat, was weitergehen wird, der Dialog, der Versuch, äh, Politikbeeinflussung in Brüssel im Gesetzgebungsprozess zu organisieren, dass wir dort einbringen als Zivilgesellschaft unsere besonderen Stärken, nämlich, äh, ich sehe die in zwei Punkten, unsere unser Orientierungswissen. Unsere Stärke ist nicht das technische Verfügungswissen, sondern das Orientierungswissen, die Wertorientierung, was nicht heißt, dass man technische Dinge äh, irgendwelchen Experten überlassen darf. Wir brauchen auch technische Expertise. Und Einbringen dieser, dieser Orientierungs, dieses Orientierungswissen in diese Debatte bedeutet vor allem auf zwei Ebenen, dass wir klar machen, dass es noch etwas mehr gibt und dass Veränderung des Finanzwesens und die Schaffung eines nachhaltigen Finanzwesens darüber hinausgeht, jetzt einen Resolution Fund zu finden, Trendbanken, Ringfencing oder sonst etwas zu betreiben. Das heißt also, das große Ganze, die weitergehenden Ziele, die weitergehenden Orientierungen und Perspektiven nicht wegzulassen, sondern auch dann, wenn sie realpolitisch im Augenblick nicht durchsetzbar sind, sozusagen in der Debatte zu halten, am Leben zu halten. Denn ohne diesen Carrot, ohne diese Karotte vorne dran, äh, gibt es historisch sowieso nur Stillstand. Man braucht also diese Antriebskraft. Und zweitens gehört dazu auch das, worin wir sowieso schon immer stark sind, die kritische Begleitung von äh, Projekten, von Regierungen äh, und Finanzindustrie zu betreiben. Und äh, hier jetzt nicht nur im engeren Sinne sagen wir mal, finanztechnisch zu argumentieren, sondern das Thema auch zu verknüpfen mit seinen europapolitischen Dimensionen. Und dazu gehört für mich klar festzustellen, nicht alles, auf wo das Label Europa draufhängt und draufgeklebt wird, muss gut sein und automatisch. Emanzipatorische Politik muss sich an Werten orientieren. Und wenn ich von unserem Orientierungswissen gesprochen habe, dann gehört dazu, dass Europa als Kern europäische Werte hat. Und hier insbesondere sollte man gucken auf jene, die ganz besonders spezifisch sind, die sozusagen der unique selling point sind von Europa. Die Menschenrechte und die Demokratie gibt es auch in Australien und in den USA. Das spricht nicht gegen sie, sondern heißt nur, es ist kein, keine Besonderheit Europas. Frieden ewigen gibt es auch zwischen Kanada und den USA. Auch das ist jetzt nicht unbedingt der unique selling point. Und Vielfalt ist in Indien viel größer als hier in Europa. Was aber relativ einmalig ist, wo man, was man nicht in Indien, in Kanada, USA und Australien findet, ist das europäische Sozialmodell, ist das, was man als rheinischen Kapitalismus einmal bezeichnet hat. Und das ist etwas, was sozusagen als emanzipatorische Substanz in all diesen Vorschlägen vorhanden sein muss. Und wenn es das nicht ist, darf man sich nicht scheuen zu sagen, nein, danke, das ist nicht Europa, das ist das Europa der Banken, aber nicht das Europa der Menschen. Auch das gehört mit dazu, in diese Debatte solche Positionen offensiv zu vertreten. Und das bedeutet jetzt für unsere weitere Strategie, dass wir zum einen, wie Thierry das gesagt hat, diesen Prozess auch der eigenen Capacity-Bildung, der Positionsbestimmung weiter betreiben werden in verschiedenen Konferenzen, Gelegenheiten, Produktion von Papieren. Wir werden einen Report machen von dieser Tagung, den werden Sie dann alle bekommen. Ein Report heißt jetzt nicht eine Dokumentation und Sie brauchen auch nicht Angst haben, es wird niemand dort wörtlich zitiert werden, sondern wir wollen eine zusammenfassende, einen zusammenfassenden Text machen, der auch nach außen hin äh, verstehbar ist und verstanden wird. Also in diesen Formen wird die Debatte weitergehen. Und wir werden äh, zweitens versuchen, in den allgemeineren äh, Debatten zur Finanzmarktregulierung und zur weiteren Zukunft von Europa, Schuldenkrise, Governance, äh, dieses Thema mit einbringen und äh, sozusagen den Kampf um die Köpfe auch 
anhand dieses Themas führen. Aber wir werden es ganz bestimmt nicht zu unserer ganz großen und führenden Kampagne machen. Da gibt es andere. Jüngstes Beispiel für eine erfolgreiche Politisierung und Skandalisierung war das Thema, zumindest hier in Deutschland, die Spekulation mit Nahrungsmitteln. Das hat zu konkreten Druck geführt, das hat Schlagzeilen gemacht, da hat eine Bank zurückgezogen, eine andere noch nicht. Aber in dieser Form und in dieser Reife sozusagen sehe ich unser Thema von heute noch nicht. Das heißt, wie gesagt, jetzt nicht, dass ich Sie resignieren entlassen möchte, sondern unterm Strich teile ich voll und ganz, was Thierry vor mir gesagt hat. Diese Konfiguration mit den drei Organisationen, das kann man natürlich auch noch variieren, fand ich gut, das ist innovativ. Und auch das Format dieser Debatte ist interessant gewesen und deswegen würde ich jetzt aus Wiedsicht sagen, ich bin sehr glücklich, dass das so gelaufen ist, danke Ihnen alle, aber ehe ich jetzt dem Dirk von der etwas kleineren Partnerorganisation in unserem Joint Van das Schlusswort gebe, will ich nur noch eines sagen, ich bin nicht pessimistisch. Ich bin auch nicht optimistisch, sondern ich glaube, was wir brauchen, ist eine realistische Analyse und Herangehensweise an die Situation, an diese dramatische Mehrfachkrise, in der wir in Europa sind. Aber ich sehe auch an einzelnen Feldern durchaus Fortschritte und Veränderungen. Denken wir an die Finanztransaktionssteuer als eines Beispiel, aber es gibt auch andere. In diesem Sinne mein Teil zu Ende und Dirk hat das Wort. Ja, schönen Dank. Die Veranstaltung stand ja heute unter der Überschrift Die Europäische Bankenunion – Weg aus der Krise? Fragezeichen. Ich denke, dass die Antwort, die wir heute darauf gefunden haben, ein klares Nein ist. Die Europäische Bankenunion wird nicht den Weg aus der Eurokrise weisen. Diese Schlussfolgerung, denke ich, können wir problemlos gemeinsam ziehen. Wir werden weiterhin an dem Thema arbeiten, Peter hat das erwähnt. Für uns Gewerkschaften ist die Frage zentral nach den Strukturen des Bankensystems. Das ist aus Beschäftigten-Sicht, die organisieren wir ja, die maßgebende Frage. Wie sehen nachhaltige Strukturen aus? Wie muss ein nachhaltiges Bankensystem ausgestaltet werden? Dazu haben wir heute vieles gehört. Wir werden die Diskussion fortsetzen. Auch in dieser Konstellation, das hat sich, glaube ich, sehr gut bewährt. Und jetzt will ich am Schluss nochmal all denen danken, die an der Organisation der Veranstaltung mitgewirkt haben, ohne die die Veranstaltung nicht zustande gekommen wäre. Da wäre zunächst mal an erster Stelle unsere Dolmetscherin, die uns, denke ich, hervorragend durch den Tag geleitet haben. Da würde ich nochmal um einen extra Applaus bitten für deren Arbeit. Ich möchte mich auch bedanken bei unseren Technikern, die dafür gesorgt haben, dass die Dolmetschung auch gut funktioniert hat, dass das Technische auch ähm, funktioniert hat. Ich möchte mich bedanken natürlich bei unseren Referenten, die keine Mühen gescheut haben, hierher zu kommen und trotz der drei Krisen, Schneefall, Streik und, äh, und Zypern, haben wir es ja am Ende, des, am Ende des Tages doch hinbekommen, dass alle Referenten, ihren Job machen konnten und den auch sehr gut gemacht haben. Also dafür auch nochmal recht herzlichen Applaus. Und namentlich möchte ich mich nochmal bedanken an denjenigen, die im Hintergrund auch mitgewirkt haben, bei der Silvia Hoffmann, bei Martin Braun, Markus Henn, Anita Weber. All diejenigen haben in den letzten Wochen dafür gesorgt, dass diese Veranstaltung in der Form stattfinden konnte. Dafür auch nochmal recht herzlichen Dank. Jetzt bleibt mir nur noch übrig, euch zu danken für eure aktive Teilnahme, für eure Wortbeiträge. Ihr habt maßgeblich dazu beigetragen, dass es eine gelungene Veranstaltung wurde und wünsche euch jetzt noch einen guten Nachhauseweg. Vielen Dank.